Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle Lou Carriger. Um, I'm not an architect. I think I'm here to model being not an architect uh, in this conversation. Uh, and you'll hear more from me later. Thank you and welcome. Um, <clears throat> why is urban design important today? Uh, and what is urban design? Um, because you'll, you'll see that two architects will be giving presentations on urban design. But what architects do isn't necessarily urban design and vice versa. And you'll see from these architects' presentations um, what they contribute to the field. Um, so in the context of, of what we'll see, here are three preliminary provisional thoughts on their contributions. The first is authorship. In urban design, authorship involves an extended process of community input, and the method of community engagement is often part of the design process itself. With architecture, the design might stem from the architect's personal vision, whereas urban design stems from an arrived at collective intention beyond the voice of the architect alone. Second, form. Urban design often takes the form of a large landscape, infrastructure, and perhaps some buildings. While an architecture project is for the most part the inside and outside of a building, urban design includes a much bigger area of public space. Because public space is such a major part of urban design, it has the potential to contribute to inclusive civic life. And then finally, at scale. Given the size of climate and natural, nature-related disasters, it's imperative to work at a large scale to have a positive impact. Urban design is so vitally important today because it's the discipline that has the tools and knowledge to work at the scale of climate and natural events. It's a great pleasure to co-introduce our presenters today, two architects whose inventive urban design work has helped to define authorship form and at scale proposals today. Momoyo Kaijima is a Tokyo-based architect and co-founder of Atelier Bow Wow. She and her partner, Yoshiharu Tsukamoto, bridge research and practice and have produced novel ways of making urban design and architecture focused um, on social effects. Their works over three decades include urban proposals, such as the post 2011 tsunami project reconstructing Momo no Ura village. Um, she is a professor at ETH Zurich and the co-author of three books that have deeply influenced numerous generations of designers, Made in Tokyo from 2001, Behaviorology from 2010, and Architectural Ethnography 2018. Um, Shohei Shigematsu is a partner at OMA, Office for Metropolitan Architecture and is based out of the New York office. With an emphasis on maximum specificity and process-oriented design, Sho is responsible for urban and public space designs around the world, including the Willow Campus Master Plan, an integrated mixed-use village for Facebook in Menlo Park, a new civic center in Bogota, Colombia, the largest transit-oriented development currently underway in North America, and a post-Hurricane Sandy urban water strategy for New Jersey. Um, he's taught at the Harvard Graduate School of Design and is the co-author of OMA NY Search Terms. Um, so for these two presentations, um, they'll both give presentations, and then afterwards we'll have a group discussion. So welcome. Um, Momoyo and Shohei, and uh, we look forward to your presentations. Thank you, Jeffrey. Um, Michelle, so to uh, introduce us, uh, me, and uh, sorry, <laughs> today presentation, 20 minutes, so that's why it's a bit uh, sh quick, <laughs> short, but uh, um, um, my attribute also to try to um, explain about the architecture behaviorology. So it means um, also how to behave architecture, but human and also people and also architecture itself. And then uh, why we try to see this kind of things. The importance is I come from Tokyo and then also the Tokyo is very, very big urban transformation 
in the last uh, yeah, 200 more than. Because um, Edo period, uh, before Tokyo, it was called um, uh, just one single story high building and uh, yeah, terracotta tile covering. And about uh, after the Meiji Restoration, so the, uh, we started to use a um, lot of um, uh, European or Amer European technology and started to make another um, scale of the building in the uh, Edo context. But um, today we also had an explanation of the counter great counter earthquake, so 1923, uh, was totally so damaged in the central part of uh, Tokyo. And then um, after so the, um, around the uh, Taisho period and also Showa, so we tried to investigate the concrete building and more uh, uh, exploring the, the European technology imported into the Japanese context. Of course, we could study to make a more large scale of the building and the large boulevard and so on. But uh, after the continuation of the, um, uh, we, Tokyo had also a big bombing, so the, uh, the end of the World War II. So the, it's again to the totally subversed to the uh, open uh, spaces. And then 1964, so we have also the Olympic Games coming. So before, uh, during this period, so we had a lot of so also the new development, the using the existing context, and also the uh, Shinkansen and the uh, TV towers, so the mo lot of things around. And then, um, so this, um, Today, so around 2010, so we had a very big uh, greater East uh, Tokyo was happened so like that. And then Jeffrey uh, explained my the project uh, about the Tokyo. So the uh, 2000, uh, we published one book. It's called Made in Tokyo. So it's an anonymous building, but designed by very uh, creative people who wanted to investigate a new business in the Tokyo dense city. Uh, context, and then we try to explain to the collect uh, around 80 different examples to uh, illustrate the uh, uh, manner of the Tokyo uh, buildings. And also the same parallel, so we picked a small um, building inside an uh, interesting, uh, very so tiny society, so the many uh, creative owner who wants to have an own business, they made a a uh, small uh, building, so it's, we call it the pet architecture. So it's like a dog and cat, so among our <laughs> society. And also the Bauer had a lot of, uh, uh, well, one single uh, family uh, project, so because uh, we had a lot of good offer who wants to have a own uh, creative life to uh, collaborate with us. So, and then this book is also the uh, collection of, uh, by our uh, collaboration with the uh, client to uh, several so projects. So that's why so like, we are very appreciate this uh, individual so creative so partners and how we can um, develop and how we can so create a new uh, lifestyle by own uh, obsession, but same time as uh, uh, motivation and also emotion. And uh, also the, yeah, the end, the Tokyo uh, phenomena of the urban context is uh, coming from this kind of uh, personal but individual so, um, experiment. And then also that we try to understand how it looks like. So, and always uh, that is our intention of the diversity of Tokyo. And then so these um, things, uh, sorry, so these things also the, um, this, um, well, through this uh, kind of um, <clears throat> um, my practice, so by Atari Bawa, as uh, also the very important uh, fundamental so knowledge and skill in our architecture practice. And then when 2011, so we had a very big earthquake in Japan, so what we can do, that is also a very important question to us. And then this is the first image of what we did um, in uh, um, uh, Ishinomaki, so Momono Village. So 
Um, that time, so still, um, electricity does, didn't come to the, um, where we stay uh, during the camping, so the, um, we could not bring the computer, just we had a pen and the paper, so uh, after the many interview with the fisherman village locally, so, and then we just uh, draw, so by ourselves, to what we heard and what we can collect at that moment. And then, so one year later, so we uh, assembled these old images, and also the, the camp was occurred by uh, different uh, schools, uh, laboratories together. So almost we were 100 people, and then also the, it's called the Archeate, uh, after the um, tsunami uh, or after the earthquakes. So, so the Tohoku, uh, my university and also the many other Japanese university uh, uh, teacher and architects to create a, a platform for recovery. And then so after, so we tried to make uh, some uh, new uh, proposal to the, uh, to the, um, to the so areas. And then so we test uh, several things. But uh, unfortunately, so the area has a lot of lack of the labor and a lot of lack of the resources. So that's why so we could not uh, propose exactly what we want. But um, um, maybe two years later, so the one fisherman, uh, well, fisherman so leader, so the Mr. Koya, so he started to ask me to the support his vision or dream, so because he wanted to have a, a newcomer in his uh, fisherman village to create a, a next generation fisherman. And then we started to um, uh, assemble the, it's called community, a uh, committee, so for new fisherman school and uh, with uh, local people. And then we started to discuss what is the program of the newcomers and then finally, so we, uh, found uh, the one frame was the uh, fisherman's schools. And then fisherman's school, we started to design the uh, textbook, firstly just uh, 10 pages, uh, collecting the local knowledge, and uh, just started to uh, draw by, with my students together, because uh, there is no uh, way of uh, informing uh, what is a fishery from the, that period. Yes. And then, of course, the, we started to make uh, some program first day, first program is just three days, and then uh, several uh, programs, like uh, teaching the rope work by fishermen, uh, and also local uh, fishery, and also uh, leading the, um, the tour of the fisherman village, and also cooking the sashimi with the fresh uh, fish by also fishermen. So, this was a very well uh, received, and then uh, two, of, uh, uh, two of the students are coming to the later the, uh, fishermen in this village. And then we spent uh, almost uh, 12 times uh, in the last 10 years, uh, we uh, did the several fishermen school, but, uh, and this is the seventh uh, fisherman school, so we found also the difficulty to the uh, where uh, people uh, can accommodate uh, to this place because uh, most of the area are prohibited to leave anymore because the uh, area was totally damaged by tsunami and the tsunami zone was uh, not uh, able to, uh, it, tsunami zone could not be a, a place for living. So that's why so we tried to find uh, some new space for living and what new space for business. And then this is a one fisherman school so project. Uh, we made a model and to also understand what, where people can live and where people can use. And then finally so we found uh, many of, maybe so some of the foot of the mountain area so can be also create a new space for business or living. And then after uh, we uh, take another program for fisherman school, it means uh, forest, uh, topic is forest. And then so we invite the uh, forester to uh, help us to how to cut the tree in the forest. 
and also how to create the uh, material and how to create the place for living. And then uh, this place was also uh, next planning for uh, designing place for accommodation, for camping, or like uh, a learning space or small school uh, for, uh, uh, for the fishery, uh, fisherman's life. And then uh, Adri Bawa designed the main house. It's not so big, or around the 100 square meter. And then also we invite the four uh, young architects to design the cottage backside of the mountain. The finally, so two of the cottages were realized by them. Uh, my next time, so I also to show the another story. But uh, yeah, the first three, so like uh, this open the uh, forest, it's done by uh, ourselves or like uh, inviting the forest union uh, to, to support uh, us together and then also um, many uh, part were also supported by um, local uh, volunteers and uh, we made also footpaths for the area by ourselves and also some timber uh, it was coming from the cut from the site and we asked to the local uh, mill factory to thin the uh, timber for uh, two cottages. And then this material is uh, open to the uh, uh, summer school, we call, so to invite the volunteer to uh, make a building together with the local carpenter. And it was a very nice uh, summer school, so around 20 people uh, coming together and also including a local carpenter and then two architects group, uh, two young architects also support for each project to responsible to finish the project. And then this is a, a result, uh, what we did. So you see the uh, sea back front and then also after the main house and the triangle one cottage, it done the dot architects. And then another triangle is made by Satokura Architects. And this is a video for uh, maybe you can see the uh, several uh, surroundings. Uh, area is uh, uh, originally was um, the vegetable uh, field uh, for the fishermen. Uh, it was also cultivated by the uh, former fishermen uh, generation. And then after the 1960s, uh, area was uh, uh, planted uh, by the uh, cedar tree. It is a uh, um, you know, political um, a policy of Japanese government, uh, which for the uh, lack of the timber resources after World War II. And then um, the, we uh, try to keep it because of the, this reason, the original land uh, was very beautifully terraced by the uh, local fishermen. So that's why so we try to keep the original so, terrace as much as possible. And uh, some part of the retaining stone wall was damaged. So that's why so we try to keep. And then also like uh, there is one, uh, professor uh, in Tokyo Tech, uh, she is uh, uh, Sanada Junko. Uh, she uh, also the, ran another um, stone uh, masonry school in Japan uh, NP, as an NPO, and uh, I, we invited her to support to repair the stone masonry. And then after, so we also still continue to support uh, to the, some recovery, not only the building, but also the including the festivals. The festival was a summer festival, so for local people to exchange uh, uh, community. So in the summer to, with the ancient, uh, what do you call it, like a obon, we call it obon in the summer, so we have uh, some ancient uh, uh, festival, so and then so that that we uh, and they made a, a straw boat for uh, for exchange with uh, like ancient and then so themselves, so and then we try to learn how to make a straw uh, boat uh, from the uh, very old fishermen around 80 or 90 years old to invite to teach us. 
And uh, this is a uh, kind of uh, the genealogy of the uh, drawings of the area. So first uh, was um, very old, uh, so fisherman village, and of course. Um, they uh, started to change uh, more, like focusing on the fishermen in the fish, um, uh, fish, uh, fishing industry, and then the uh, uh, area connection between the mountain and the beach what becomes a change, and also the the beach becomes a conc concrete harbor, and also like a make a more industrial so atmosphere. But uh, it was attacked by tsunami 2011. And then now the memorability starts. So that's why, so like a last, not, tsunami is also a very big uh, problem, but also the industrialization of the 20th century is also very changed uh, the, the village. So that means, I think uh, uh, what we understood also the, through the, um, this um, uh, recovery support uh, as architect, how the last century, um, uh, our village and the fisherman village were transformed. Uh, so that's uh, that's also a very important part, because uh, like um, um, fisherman's village, maybe or not only the fisherman village, but also the old Japanese traditional village were. Originally, it's so made by local resources and local so people. So that's why so many resources coming into from the mountain or beach or area or field. So all the materials comes to the local material to assemble to as an architecture, so traditional way. So, but uh, of course, uh, modern period and also the modernization that we can get a lot of new materials, so metal and also another concrete and so on. So, but it's create a very different network uh, behind of the architecture. So that means um, we are always uh, confronting so to the, how uh, we can reach to the local resources. Unfortunately, so maybe um, before the modernization, so, uh, we could reach more easily our neighbor uh, resources next to our society, like a backside of the mountains, we can get the timber and to make a house. But nowadays, even if we have uh, uh, some timber uh, backside on mountains, so we could not cut by ourselves and we could not build a house. That is also one problem of the, our society. So that's why it's so like a uh, 21st century. So how we can uh, break this barrier to uh, back again our resources to more close to our life. So that is uh, maybe also a question. And also through the recovery process, I learned a lot these difficulties. And then uh, this is a summary. So the how we can design with the disaster. So that is... Uh, uh, learning from uh, this experience, uh, I point the 10 things. First one is uh, learning from the local uh, history and ethnography. So that means, uh, I think, uh, before the, we visit in the uh, village, I try to read a lot of history. And also, like, uh, we Japan, we have a nice, a good ethnographer's uh, report in the history. So that, that helps a lot to understand what it was and what we were different. And the second is a walk. Uh, most of the village had a very special topography and the topography or geographical context very related to the first industry. So that's why it's like a walk is very, very um, uh, coming into the sense to the, the what they had and what we could understand as a body. So that is second part. The third one is a talk with the locals in different position. So uh, that's also very important, not talk with the leaders. <laughs> uh, we need to talk a very different wife or like uh, uh, kids or, or a temple master or, so, or a primary school teacher or president. So that helps a lot. So 
in this kind of local people, always if I, we are, I'm an outsider, so they try to inform me to the, what they need. Very different way. So that's why so like, I can compose a different input into my vision, so that's very, very important for me. And the fourth, the collaboration with the other field expert. So I'm not fisher, fishery <laughs> expert, but now it becomes very uh, good <laughs> knowledge because of the, uh, I think I have a lot of friends of the fishermen and also um, I also studied to the uh, dialogue with the uh, fishermen's union people or like um, maybe so the forest and so on. So that's why so like uh, through this re recovery process, I started to contact many other field uh, experts. That's, uh, I also very uh, learn a lot. And also the fifth one is the uh, drawing. So architects can also very good at the drawing. So um, because we are trained, so. but drawings helps to uh, have a better communication, not only the words, um, to including the, some vision and also some images. So that helps a lot and uh, I test and uh, it was very, very effective. The sixth and uh, creating the, the a platform to share. So um, yeah, we made a several publication and also the, we made a website or we made uh, also the from a pamphlet and booklet. So that's always uh, helping. And also like uh, Arcade, what we create the platform. So that's uh, collaboration teamwork was also very, very helpful for sure. And the seventh, the fund. Almost this was the first time for me to funding. So, but fund also very attractive and to invite many people to make attention. That's also interesting point. And eight in the building together, what I show. So like, uh, uh, not only the um, order, not only the order the building, making together is also very very fun, and also we can extend a lot. So that's why. So like, uh, if I could or if we could, so I really recommend to building together. So. And the ninth is so using so. Uh, normally, architects is sometimes just uh, design, and we need to go away. So, but uh, in this case, we are really so users, and also we also the same the repair and the maintenance together. So with the local, so that is also the different position of the normal architects. So we are more involving. So at the end, I also said. Uh, one uh, professor, so he's an um, uh, eco ecologist, so he also explained to what is the role as an architect, the new stage is insider, outsider, he explained. So that I'm very um, understandable, so what this, this word. And also the importance of the embodiment of the environment is also, I think, a key issue for thinking the 21st century model of our future society. Thank you very much. I just start. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Abisan. Thank you, UCLA. Thank you, Japan House. And thank you all for coming in beautiful Saturday evening. Um, so I have a very different style to Kaijima-san. I have so many slides, but go very fast, as always. Uh, I took a liberty to show you the project that I was uh, very excited to share in LA, the, our first building in, in LA. Uh, it's a synagogue uh, gathering space, because I thought this is also a kind of post-pandemic issue, a post-crisis issue where gathering was challenged during the pandemic, but this building had to go, had to be built during the pandemic entirely, and it hasn't had an opening event whatsoever because of the pandemic, etc. So I was going to invite you, uh, some, some of you tomorrow, but uh, the building is un going under maintenance, so I can't. So I will show you the uh, some glimpse of the uh, building. So this is the main event space on the ground that funnels uh, people from the Wilshire to the uh, historical courtyard of the school. The second uh, chapel space <coughs> frames the existing stained glass window of the existing temple, half outside, half inside. This is at night. You can see the kind of lit 
stained glass window. And there's the rooftop is also event space and there's a sunken courtyard that brings nature to the third floor, which is an Annenberg foundation for uh, aging. So these three voids are interconnected. Uh, there's a view from up to the dome uh, from the event space and on the second floor you can look down and look up so you can see the three voids are interconnected providing surprising views. The facade is uh, uh, inside out of the uh, dome space. Was, uh, the dome is constructed with a series of hexagons, so wrapping the hexagon uh, on the outside of the event space, a rotated uh, uh, hexagons with rectangular window creating this pattern. It's actually the same, uh, exactly the same ingredients in same colored uh, precast panels, but because of the rotation and the, the pattern actually changes the color, which was surprising to us too. Uh, this is inside in the atrium. And we even had uh, those, those windows in the bathroom, so you can see that uh, the windows are basically canceling the mirrors or even the kind of urinals. Uh, so. I'm, I think I will choose to pee on that central one. <laughs> um, so, um, disaster. Um, I, I've been always interested in the crisis. Uh, I didn't know this, but uh, I learned from a Greek person the crisis means decision, crisis uh, in, in Greek. So, uh, I thought this was something uh, that we can actually use. Uh, as you know, the disaster in Japan um, and the response was for me not so creative, although of course I understand the need. Um, Japan should be leading the design integrated uh, pre, uh, you know, resiliency project, but somehow Japan continues to build this kind of walls that are not really uh, helping the community, maybe nor the views and the, um, the environment. So here, ironically, in US, there was an interesting project after Hurricane Sandy. As you know, big disaster in a very, you know, the, like New York region. Uh, it was said to be, it takes $2.5 trillion to build the wall that is preventing the, the, the same level of uh, hurricane when they come to New York, which is, of course, not possible. So what we did was to investigate the whole, um, the the risk and value and impact. People misunderstand the risk as a frequency of event, but risk is actually the frequency times the asset you have. So the risk is higher in New York than Florida, for example. Uh, so we chose Hoboken, which was a very interesting process. The municipalities had to choose a good designer to uh, get the funding from the government. So for the first time as an architect, we were actually pitched by the municipality to be part of their team, uh, which is, as you know, it's often the opposite. Uh, so we teamed up with Hoboken, which is a, used to be an island. So the water actually came exactly where how the island was. was. So it came from the two sides and isolated the Hoboken entirely. Hoboken is maybe you don't, I didn't know this too, fourth densest city in US, uh, big increase in population, 94% uh, surface imper impermeable, so all hard surfaces, and two thirds are now in the FEMA flood zone. That means you really can't afford a house because uh, of the, the FEMA map. And 100% of the regional utility, like infrastructure, was built in the flood zone. <clears throat> so we thought it was a good case to test the, the resiliency project. So this is our strategy, resist, delay, store, and discharge. I don't go into it too much, but basically using resistance through the coastlines, creating more permeable space, creating more rooftop uh, green, et cetera. So there are a series of things, but there, you know, Designing through disaster, which was a theme here too, but I was a little bit uh, taken off by people who are using the disaster as a means to actually create a grand vision. I don't name who it is, but um, 
I thought actually you can, nowadays you can really look at the water movement by very precisely through the modeling as, as we saw in other presentations. And we discover that actually you can really isolate the area that you need the wall. And the wall doesn't need to be that high like you saw in Japan. In this case, of course, tsunami is different. So what we did was to create a park that really uh, uses a sports field to prevent, but also where you needed the wall, we basically integrated information, benches, uh, uh, planters, uh, and alleyways, etc., and even the art wall. So this is something that is ongoing and it's uh, under construction. I said this is a beautiful model, but somehow we won the competition and we got the funding, about $200 million. But now after we got, there's an architecture and engineering firm that takes over. So there is also a issue. They say design-led, but in the end, like the big firms take over and we don't have any controls. Um, so in Mexico, I did the bridge after the Hohutra uh, disaster, the earthquake. Um, the, the, the Hohutra has a river in the center, but river was flooded, but also all the bridges were demolished. So initially I was invited to do a small residential intervention, but we, I decided to do a bridge because I thought the river was, the city was divided in half and I thought actually building a bridge could create an interesting idea about the public space and connecting the two sides, but also a public space that embraces the river. <clears throat> we didn't have any budget, so we had to use an existing beam, like industrial beam like this. But, and there was a budget for one million US dollars to create two small plazas in the either side of the bridge and a bike lay and pedestrian for 100 meter we negotiated to actually use that uh, beam and not have any public plaza to actually extend 50 more meter and integrate the public plaza entirely to the bridge. So this is the bridge uh, that is an extension of a street and it's double decker because we're using the uh, I-beam as the, the basically the, the existing I-beam as the uh, the, the structure. So we only thing we did was to design the holes uh, working with a structural engineer. So some are, it has a different sizes so you can sit or you can use it as a table or sometimes you can go to the other side or sometimes you have a stair to go up to the upper deck. So you have different behaviors throughout the bridge and upper deck is also above the flood zone in the, in the future. So Actually, this bridge works when the, the next uh, flood happens. Uh, the, the street extension was like this, but this owner complained. So we had to, of course, uh, deal with it, and we had to bend. Uh, and this was the final product. So you can see it's, the bending actually makes it more interesting, and the upper deck and the lower deck bridge waiting for funding to come through for a while but it's Mexico, you know. Um, so the reef line, this is a very interesting project in Miami Beach that I'm luckily involved. Miami Beach in the past, in 80s, because of their focus on tourism, they actually made the artificial beach extended and that killed the reef uh, that was existing. So this is a reef, uh, reconstruction of the reef as well as uh, basically, sea level rise is eroding the current beach. So we, are, we there's an initiative to create a reef again to prevent the waves to erode the, uh, uh, undo the erosion of the beach. But just doing a reconstruction of the, uh, I'm looking at the time, reconstruction of the um, uh, beach, uh, the reef is easy but uh, some entrepreneurs in Miami Beach uh, thought there could be a in more interesting way, which is to basically embed the art a sculpture into the ocean and then let the um, reef re uh, reconstruct itself over the art. So you can actually, uh, it's a scul underwater sculpture park as well as a reef construction uh, Project. So this is a first project by Leandro Endich, the Argentinian artist, very uh, ironic uh, installation called Car Traffic Jam. Uh, 
uh, under the water. So as if, you know, it's like a kind of uh, post-Earth kind of uh, installation, but uh, the reef will grow over it. So it's a kind of convergence of tourism, environmental protection, art. So it's kind of a very interesting project that could only happen in uh, Miami, I think, at the moment. So this is his installation on the beach prior to uh, the actual installation under the water, which will happen this year. So now I'm a master planner of choosing artists, but working with environmentalists and also City of Miami Beach. Uh, and Knights Foundation, etc. A lot of different specialists doing the master plan, but also uh, uh, also creating a barrier. You know, the, these kind of tetrapods are easy to ready-made ones are often used to create a, a barrier. You have to have a you have to still prevent the waves to uh, uh, swipe the uh, sculpture underwater sculpture. So we had to also design the protective barrier. So uh, we came up with this kind of thing where you actually see through from every angle, like soloid sculpture, or we call it topiary, like a French garden, because uh, it will be covered in a, a coral um, a reef uh, in the future. So these are the barriers that we designed. We also designed a spiral one that I was o I'm always fascinated by the sea uh, creatures that could be really like a, a bird, bird wire like installation or it could be a mess and still could work as a barrier. And we had to also design a sculpture. So we, I designed one. This is basically a single unit of um, spiral stair. You know, under the water, the gravity, uh, when the gravity is less, of course, the stair becomes obsolete. So I, I was interested in actually testing how the stair will become uh, redefined under the water. Like, I, of course, it's everyone's dream to, as an architect, to design something like Piranesian or uh, this kind of uh, slightly illusional uh, moment. So this is an arena, so using this single unit of spiral stair that, again, mimics a little bit of the sea creatures. And we discovered that there are a lot of underwater activities nowadays, but the, the, like Leandro's car, you know, you can never be immersed under the corals, so I thought it's actually better to create a space uh, underneath, so this is like an arena where maybe someone can have a wedding uh, in the end. <laughs> So this was the NFT. Nowadays, everything is turned into NFT to actually make more money. Uh, so this is the NFT we uh, launched at the last Art Basel. Uh, and actually recently we got the uh, final also funding from the Miami Beach, so it will be continuing. So you will see, you will start to see the installation. So finally, I have five more minutes. Uh, count, you know, actually 5.5. 5. Uh, but then I would like to show the future because this this group was called like future. So. I have been investigating the potential of food production at the GSD for uh, like four years, a while back, but I always thought that uh, in our generation we have to show our own vision for the kind of future city, and I thought there could be a hint uh, at the food production. Why I thought about that? Because uh, within the fun three fundamentals of human being, like clothing, food, and shelter, of course, architecture and clothing, as you know, surrender to the globalism quite easily, but the food remains to be very specific to local condition, but at the same time could be global. Food is the uh, biggest industry in the world currently, and food is always involved in your daily life in a d different scale because it's multi-processed. So I thought of seeing a new typology, a new potential of architecture and urban design through the lens of food. 
Uh, this is a great example by MVRDV. As you know, this is a marketplace wrapped with housing. If you think of a market is now pushed out of the city in many cities, as it, the Tokyo is a good example, great Tsukiji market is now out of the way. But if you bring market like food back to the city and in a creative way, we, I thought we could have interesting vision for the city. Uh, actually, Frank Floyd Wright uh, proposed Broad Acre City, which uh, each landowner had to have an agricultural land. And this is the, the vision, the sketch he drew in 58, which is, you, you see like drone is uh, um, flying and the, the high rise, but also low rise food production, actually quite uh, close to the image of the current uh, vis uh, uh, ideals, I think. And this was the model of Broad Acre City, which of course at the time, maybe not so much technology of model making, so it's kind of uh, not so interesting as a sketch, but this is what's happening in China right now. So you can see the explosion of the city that meets the agricultural land, which I thought was actually not intended, but showing some kind of an interesting potential of a new city vision. Because you see the food production and the city cross crossing over. But it doesn't have to happen in that way. As you know, it's already happening. The agricultural and food production is coming back to the city using rooftops. This is in Brooklyn. This is a kind of a joke, not a joke, but a student project that uh, using the cemetery as a food production. Of course, it's a bit ironic and you don't want to eat uh, probably out of this farm, but still. Um, the, the super farm is a city entirely dedicated to produce food for Singapore's population that is planned in China. And as you know, these kind of industrial farming within is happening and now there are so many projects uh, that are trying to integrate housing and urban districts to food production and sustainability. Which I think this is uh, also in Thailand, it's built already, this is a university that has these kind of vertical, not vertical, but uh, farming, so you have ir irrigation and also sustainability measures and actually students are harvesting uh, and it's actually quite an interesting model. And nowadays, high-rises are also, uh, of course, a domain for food production. This is Stefano Boeri, of course, known as a kind of green person nowadays. Uh, I know him very well, just making fun of him. But um, this, this is now even uh, making a food production in the tower as if the green, just the green is not enough. Uh, so this is also high-rises. I actually like the image that uh, the high-rises are made for efficiency and commercial reasons, but now it's made for fruit production and actually human beings are going back to the, the, the lower, lower land. Lastly, the food is also related to mobility. This is the first McDonald's store, which is related to car and car hopping. Of course, as you know, the 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 supermarket is also related to invention of the car where you can actually store one week worth of uh, groceries into the trunk so you can you need it actually a larger footprint store that is the uh, origin of the supermarket we used to drive to the food but now you know like like this i love this building it's in la right and uh, i think but now as you know uh, the food comes to you. The, the, the total supply chain, the, 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 the movement of food is actually changing quite radically, as you know, like the drones. And this is, again, a student project, but it's also like, I don't know what he's delivering. Uh, but like even Ikea trying to make this kind of food uh, production and the, the mobility combined. So what we are doing is this kind of food-oriented community uh, buildings in U.S. in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where there is a food desert, where fresh food is not appreciated by the, the, the community there. So creating uh, not just a, a food production space, but community garden, uh, University of Kentucky, shared aggregation facility, and the market uh, spaces. Uh, we're trying to make the 
form related to food, but of course sometimes it's, uh, <laughs> it's a bit uh, tough. Um, anyway, so this was the vision for the future, and thank you for the, thank you for listening. Okay, thank you so much for these presentations, and also to our first three speakers. Um, this has been such an exciting afternoon, and I have a lot on my mind now. Um, so I'm going to make the first question, and then I think uh, Jeffrey might have a question, and then we'll open it to the audience. Um, so I'm going to try to tie a lot of things from the whole afternoon together right now. Um, I was really struck by the way that history and memory have come up in all of our speakers' presentations. Um, memories that might not just be in people, but also in the lands and in the buildings, um, and local knowledge. And so it's been nice to end with this second event, which is more hopeful and more um, thinking about proactive projects, right? Designing the future was the title of this um, session. Um, and then I was also thinking that design, as in designing the future, can feel very exclusive um, and very uh, for only a few people. Um, and so I, I think we see some of it in the presentations that you both made here. But I wanted to ask you more about your thoughts on increasing accessibility or the spread of, of um, preparing for disaster or designing for a more resilient future um, or scale, as Jeffrey noted in his introduction. Um, so, so how do we use design, how do you use design and architecture um, to, to increase the accessibility and the spread and the large scale of mitigating disaster and planning for the future? So uh, thank you very much for uh, questions. Um, yeah, I think uh, I saw also the, like after the 2011, so the first visit, I was very shocked. You know? so, and I, I think oh, even if uh, everybody was shocked. And then at the same time, it's just slowly maybe uh, in Momonara village case, like uh, first is that they try to back to the before, just before the disaster. So, but uh, unfortunately, so the land is very, very uh, difficult, and also like, they are very aged. So, the many of the uh, originally they have around 80 families, uh, 80 hu household, but the final so they decide to come back just 10 something like it's quite uh, decreasing the population, and then that's why so like uh, maybe in November, so like uh, almost. Uh, not one year later, but uh, November, so they decide to shift their idea not to back to before. <laughs> okay, we sh they should go beyond or like an another visions. That's uh, we found. Um, I saw them to to mindset and change the shift. So that that was a very uh, so I was very. Uh, shocked, but at the same time, I also encouraged. And then after, so how we can change, how we can go beyond. So that is, I think, a very good motivation for everybody and also for me too. So, so that's why, so like, of course, I try to also see something like back in history, but at the same time, it's also like uh, we try to find the future. But also, like uh, I explained to the, uh, especially like a 20th century, somehow so industrialization, and uh, I feel they found also some uh, problem in that moment, even if before disaster. So like uh, they found also like too much industrialization, fishery, and too much like a bit pollution and so on. So, um, so that's why so like uh, our, my, my uh, like a good friendship uh, local leader, now he is 93 years old. He know very well so what they had before industrialization. So that's why so like uh, he leading us to more like uh, what they had before, more better way, and then how we go to better way. So so that's that I think also the very strong engine to uh, find the better like a uh, direction for all uh, things. So well maybe like uh, this is also a good chance uh, for thinking a uh, different way. So, and then disasters sometimes helps 
uh, them and also then ask to the question. So uh, to find in the better position, reset the uh, future, yes. You mean accessibility as in for the community to act for the to be involved or access the result or access the process or I, I guess all of it. I was actually thinking I'm thinking especially about scale, right? How can like how do we make these advances and, and new ideas available to the largest number of people and the people who can um, best benefit? Oh. Mm, well, I think there's a prototypical model like the reef line project. I think as soon as we launched, uh, there are a lot of municipalities who wanted to do it too. And uh, I think the good, I think as you're saying, it's very important to make a critical mass of critical amount of good projects globally so that you can be, it can be repeated. And I, as I was saying, Japan should be leading that role, but I don't think so because of the strange ties to, you know, as you know, like uh, many things, as typical Japanese thing. But I, I really hope that uh, Japan could deploy a successful model from somewhere and then actually be smart about, you know, immediate prevention, but also like a slightly longer, uh, vis longer vision, a grand vision or longer time line vision. Uh, thank you so much for both of your presentations. They're really wonderful, and it, it, it's so amazing to see the uh, evolution of uh, both of your works. Um, I, I had no idea that Hoboken came to you to you know to do it. Um, in thinking about the future, in thinking about the role of architects in urban design, um, what are ideal projects that you would like to welcome the universe to bring to you? In so far as the impact that you think architects can have for urban design, given the natural and climate-related disasters that we'll probably encounter in the near future? <laughs> what, what, what's yours? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I don't have one, but uh, you know, like, I, I just want to do a swimming pool. That's all I want to do. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I mean, I think what, what's so interesting is that that oftentimes architects are, are every time, except for Hoboken, that we're we're um, tasked with creating something unique that is beneficial to a community based on the specific constraints of the project. However, through the experiences that you both have had working at a large scale, there must have been learnings of things where what the architect can do could be leveraged through ideal projects, that there might be a project that would enable um, a rapid evolution of thinking about how to address climate change or how to address uh, a looming natural disaster. Mm. Uh, like I think, uh, of course, Japan has an earthquake and a typhoon and a lot of disasters so directly from the nature. So, but uh, like um, now, now I'm also often so be in uh, Zurich and Switzerland. So, the Europe is very now the, uh, strongly um, confronting the energy issue, no? Like uh, because of the war, and then so like um, always discussion of, and also like especially so Switzerland has uh, having the the Alps and then to and the origin of the water in the uh, entire Europe. So that's why so like uh, they try to be a bit uh, more uh, responsible of their uh, climate change to be keeping the how like a global warming and so on. So that kind of part is very strongly to uh, discuss. And then I think also the question is also the how we reset or how we change our lifestyle. So that is also very important discussion. For example, like uh, many, many students, uh, they started to be vegetarian. So no, no take a flight. Um, and also um, like a lot of uh, reducing and uh, reframing the uh, lives themselves. But uh, I think also the 
uh, we Japan the 2011 after the Fukushima so we had also a lot of discussion about the energy issue so but like uh, I don't know 10 years late after so but now we also fa facing to the energy again but already 10 years later so like uh, we a bit forgotten the what we discuss so Maybe like we need always mind so um, this kind of a position, and then I think of course the disaster sometimes very uh, uh, visible and very more like a large case given to the share as a platform to remind us to the what is uh, what we are co confronting uh, the some certain problems, and then it's also like a very good for us to think the. Uh, um, better solutions, but uh, hmm, yeah, it's always a remind us, so, but uh, like uh, we Japanese, or we, we p human beings always forgot <laughs> easy way, so that is also a bit uh, problem, but uh, like, uh, I think um, maybe um, global issue and also one good challenging to discuss uh, to how we can make a platform and how we can uh, change our life. So that that's, I think, also a very good topic to be discussed, yes. Um, one time, um, we I actually investigated how many conferences per year globally happening with the, future, the word future is. Uh, and there are so many, as you know. And uh, I think the role of an architect or the vision of that architect projecting the future was one of the, let's say, maybe expertise or the people think it's architect's expertise to project the future, but it's getting more and more difficult no? because I think the, the, the notion of future, the timeline is changing, but also for me, like really dealing with the, the current issues and, you know, that's the only way to really project the future. And I think the, although I think that the vision is necessary too, because I think the, as I, as, as I was saying, the Tohoku region, I thought one thing that was missing was a great, the vision of how the Tohoku region should be uh, reimagined or regenerated. Uh, while each municipality in each region is, of course, doing different types of reconstruction. So uh, my, my dream project would be to really actually have both grand vision uh, and a very local project at the same time, which I'm trying to do right now in Kyushu Island. But uh, it's, 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 it's a long story. But uh, so... but. Well, it's for the future, but uh, you know, the future, I think it's becoming a little bit irrelevant. Sorry to kind of dodge your no, question. No, no, but no, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, why don't we open it up to a couple of questions and, yeah. Okay, uh, there's a, a microphone is coming to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ryo Kobayashi um, of HLab. Um, so I think my question is to both of you. Um, about the communication that you have with your user community and the operators after your project completes. Because I think those are the ones who brings your project and vision into reality. And I'm sure oftentimes you encounter a case where the, act, like the architecture itself and the project itself went extremely well, but the vision behind was not achieved, or philosophy is not achieved because of uh, I wouldn't say poor, but some, some sort of lack of communication with the operator and then the community engagement afterwards. So uh, going through the past experiences you guys have, you have, do you have any sort of common aspect of um, the you know, successful cases uh, as to the sort of engage, community engagement and you know, communication with the operators afterwards? Um, yeah, my answer is maybe simple than <laughs> Shohei, so, um, yeah, my case is uh, now the Momonora case, um, everybody aged, but same time it's also like a newcomer, so one fisherman came to the village, and then they also start to take a leadership after, so, and he becomes a fisherman, 
now, and then also like a, he is very important role so on the community. So, and then Momonobirate run by him, and also like uh, this uh, Momonobirate was found uh, by the um, uh, NP also also the uh, originally so it get uh, gave the money for building. So that's why so like. Uh, um, we, I'm also the core, uh, like a partner. So, and also now my t students become the teacher, and uh, he also taken over uh, after my night. <laughs> I'm often be sitting, <laughs> but he also work a lot for this uh, fisherman village. So that's why. So, like I think, uh, if uh, but this kind of program, we also the arcade uh, involved uh, many students. Uh, uh, and teachers, so they are two or three generation. So that's why I so said, like, uh, this kind of uh, program, if you can guide uh, several generations together, so always uh, helping each other to a uh, different uh, position. And uh, maybe it takes, uh, it uh, have a chance to the long term, I think, uh, uh, running, I think, yeah. I think the, we have, in my case, the the strong initiative lead to this kind of projects and those initiatives are actually strong enough to secure at least like a good operational vision too. And uh, I don't think that uh, these kind of project emerges out of like a top-down system. I think it's more of a uh, people's initiative. And I think in Momoyo's case in Japan, it's actually much easier. and. Speaking of disaster, that actually creates more unity and initiative uh, in, the, in the moment of disaster, which is, of course, I'm not celebrating the disaster, but that's the kind of solidarity aspect of post-crisis where, you know, it creates a strong initiative for the time being, but of course, I don't know how long. But, uh, but I think that th those, the projects are actually becoming more and more uh, initiated through those, you know, like convergence of different minds, like art, you know, finance, uh, community engagement. So I have a optimi I'm optimistic, but of course there are bad cases and good cases. But. Other questions? We had another one right here. Yeah. Hello. Okay. Um, no, it's very interesting to hear both of you speak today in parallel um, and also in conjunction with the exhibition of the work over the years and how it all intersects um, also with the earlier presentations um, and now and how you balance these different forces between the exceptional of disaster, you know, whether it be once in 400 years or once in 60 years and the everyday, um, everyday lives in these communities and um, how you change that in terms of food production or in terms of um, the traditions of a community in fishing and so forth. And how, you know, when you look at it from a technocratic or bureaucratic position of um, building these seawalls, that becomes one of these objectives once in the 400 years versus what does that really mean hmm. in the daily life as you're um, very critical um, Shigematsu in this, and so how you balance that in these different audiences as well in addressing um, the technocrats, bureaucrats versus the community in arguing for this balance between the exceptional versus the everyday and you know how you can design in this vision but keep this balance um, between that. I don't know, it, whether in the smaller scale or in the larger scale, but I mean, I think in the two, we see this really interesting um, multiple strategies, multiple ways, whether it be inside or outside of Japan um, and ways that they're connected, but just a few thoughts in maintaining this balance. Um, I think architecture school needs to produce more clients <laughs> and tech, technocrats and technocrats because they only teach to become great architects. But I think you need to have a balance of good client, good technocrats, 
that produces good vision. And I think that's, that's one thing that I can immediately think of. But mm, we can also say we should create a system that is not dependent on them, but it's, yeah, it's difficult in Japan. But in US, in some cases, I think that kind of super, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and, the, 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 you know, not entrepreneurs, uh, how do you say, like philosophists uh, are actually, you know, creating good initiatives and it's hopeful, but I don't know. I don't know. Yes, um, yeah, I think uh, Tohoku ma, earthquake issue is a big challenging is uh, like a civil engineering and architecture. So these two departments, it's very different money, <laughs> you know, stream. So that creates a lot of difficulties. Uh, it's because, and then Archeade tried to come to the uh, from architect side to the civil engineering things. And then this is also like a very uh, big challenging and then, but same time it's also like a, we know, we learn a lot from them. So the, the, I think uh, we should exchange more. So that is a maybe very big uh, important uh, future, I think, uh, uh, maybe education <laughs> curriculum issue. So. And then, but uh, I also studied about the history, like uh, Yamaguchi Yoichiro, so like an uh, ethnographer, so wrote the interesting uh, report from the Meiji Showa Chiri, so how three times different um, disaster was happen and how every uh, disaster creates a new uh, village. And then I visited also several other cases that after the Meiji, that there is no car, so at the time, so recovery. So like uh, many, uh, my village is more like a very good dense, and then so nicely, so uh, make a footpath between the house and the house. So that creates a very easy communication for the fisherman's village. But I think 2011, so everybody accessed by truck, small truck. <laughs> so, so, and then, so that's why they want to keep them certain distance uh, for this truck road. So, and uh, this comes also um, all regulation by civil engineering so aspects. So that's why so distance of the house becomes much larger. So that creates a bit isolated situation for elderly each houses. So that is very, very different. So that's why so like of course, what is the richness and what is the safe and uh, what is uh, good? So it's a very different criteria I found. And uh, maybe we must think about uh, this quality of the uh, problem <laughs> and the quality of the life itself, so, yeah. Okay, we've gone a few minutes over, so I think um, it's time for us to thank our speakers, and then I'm going to um, call up Seiji Lippe, a professor at UCLA, who's gonna give us our closing remarks. Thank you all so much, please uh, thank our speakers. Uh, as uh, Michelle said, I'm Seiji Lippe, I'm the Associate Director of the Terasaki Center for Japanese Studies and also a professor of, of Japanese literature and culture at UCLA. I have the honor and privilege, um, but also the impossible task of providing some concluding remarks to this wonderful event. I will keep them brief as we are running uh, a little bit over time. I say it's an impossible task because these talks were so sort of filled with information. Uh, I learned so much from them. I feel like each one of the presentations, we could have spent the entire time sort of talking about them. But I hope that this is the beginning uh, or a continuation of a, of a conversation and, and collaboration that will explore these issues. I want to thank um, all of the participants, uh, and I also want to thank our uh, co-hosts and collaborators at the Japan House for uh, having us here uh, today. Um, this uh, symposium, but also the ongoing uh, exhibit has required a lot of, of work and effort and planning. And we are, um, the Japan House uh, staff and uh, its director, uh, Yuko, uh, President Dr. Yuko Kaifu, has done such excellent work. Uh, I also want to thank the staff of the Terasaki Center, uh, Marty and Christian and Noel, who have done so much work as well. 
Um, the, this is the Terasaki Center's Global Japan Forum, which is an annual uh, event. It's our biggest uh, event of the year that we do usually in May, uh, but this year we're doing it earlier in uh, January. Uh, it began about 11 years ago in uh, 2012. Uh, not long after Hitoshi became director of the Terazaki Center and I became the associate director. And the idea behind this forum was to create a space for dialogue and exchange of ideas centered around, around Japan, but that would cross various boundaries. For example, we wanted to bridge the divide between different uh, academic disciplines, but also between uh, the world of academia and uh, the general public and also to bridge the gap between different national uh, cultures as well. And I think it's hard to think of a more uh, fitting example of the vision uh, for this forum than today's uh, event. We had a collaboration uh, and a gathering of leading architects, uh, scholars, uh, researchers, uh, all discussing uh, a very pressing uh, one of the most pressing uh, topics in contemporary life. The first uh, global forum that we had, as I said, took place uh, in 2012. It was about a year after the disaster of March 11th. And we have always felt the impact of that cataclysmic event on each of the events that we've done since then. The first year, we uh, welcomed Senator Daniel Inoue, and actually what he was talking about was the cooperation and collaboration between the Japan and the US in the aftermath of the Tohoku disaster. Uh, March 11th, needless to say, has had a decisive impact on Japanese uh, culture and Japanese society, but its impact has also been felt uh, worldwide. And it is sort of provided uh, an, an example of the way in which uh, issues facing Japan are, are so interconnected and intertwined with things that are going on around the world. As a specialist in literature and culture, I've been listening to today's presentations with great sort of interest. Um, the, the, the concern and the theme of disaster has been very prominent in Japanese culture. Uh, one might talk about the imagination of disaster that has been a core theme uh, in Japanese literature since antiquity. Um, there is one of the, one of the key aesthetic uh, concepts in Japanese culture is an aesthetic of impermanence or sort of transitoriness, uh, which is based on the conflict of sort of being attracted and drawn to the material and sensuous world, but also being aware that it is transitory, it is fleeting, it is not going to last. And certainly in the modern period, um, as you saw in uh, Kaijima-san's slides about the transformations of, of Tokyo, the experience of periodic destruction and renewal has been one of the core experiences of modern Japanese culture and modern Japanese uh, society. The city of Tokyo, as she men mentioned, has undergone periods of at least four significant uh, uh, moments of destruction and uh, reconstruction from revolution, war, natural disaster, and economic development. And so this um, consciousness of living with disaster has been something that's been very important, a very important part of Japanese uh, culture. I would say, especially in the post-war period, that, that image that we saw of the Tokyo flattened and, and nothing but ruin uh, left behind has been sort of indelibly ingrained into the consciousness of people in, in Japan. Uh, it haunts the hypermodern culture, the hypermodern city that was built in the years after the war. But I also feel like now we are living in a moment where that is not an exceptional experience by any means. Certainly living here in, in California, it seems like the experience of disaster and the anticipation of the ne next disaster has become such a frequent and all-pervasive uh, concern that the kinds of things that I have been sort of studying in terms of Japanese cultural history are an everyday part of contemporary life here in California and, and elsewhere. 
Uh, and I, I really felt today that the kinds of things that the panelists are talking about are really relevant uh, to all of us in, in, um, in so many aspects of our daily lives. In thinking about the, the imagination of disaster, there are basically two different uh, temporalities. One is the retrospective gaze towards the past. Disaster is always something that has already happened, something that happened in the past and that you have to overcome as best as you can. But there's also a future temporality of disaster, the looking forward and the anticipation of a disaster that might come in the future. And uh, in a sense, today's event was organized around these two temporalities, disasters in the past and then looking forward to the future. But uh, I think the presentations also showed that these two temporalities are inextricably in intertwined that you can't really face the future and anticipate the future without an understanding about the past. Another thing that I found really uh, useful is that there are so many different kinds of knowledge that are involved in this uh, thinking about disaster and designing with disaster. Of course, there's scientific uh, knowledge that's very important, but also folk uh, knowledge, the knowledge of, the, of uh, people living uh, outside the world of, of science and engineering. And I think the panelists really presented a great example of, of the necessity of collaboration and bringing together so many different uh, forms of knowledge in dealing with this question. And finally, uh, I just was left with a sense of optimism and hope. Um, as uh, Shigematsu-san said at the end of his uh, presentation, there is a kind of community that is formed in the aftermath of crisis, in the aftermath of, of disaster, a kind of solidarity. Uh, and it's, disaster is not only the destruction of things, it's also the formation and reformulation of new forms of, of community. And I think that uh, the panelists uh, were able to show us a way to participate in that formation of community. So thank you again for such wonderful uh, presentations, uh, and thank you all for coming out uh, today.